Who loves you and who do you love? Do you know, if you didn't grow up on 80s action movies, that's probably not going to make a lot of sense. Anyway, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 2nd of August and a nice selection of updates this week. As always, you can jump to the particular update you care about the most. New videos this week. Through no reason whatsoever, I decided to dive into how we think about doing safe deployments in our environment. So I go over general best practices, but then go into some specifics around Azure guest patching and what I can do for VMs and virtual machine scale sets with the Azure guest patching service. And then also I dive into kind of an extreme of saying that updates very, very frequently, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint and how that works and how you should treat that. So hopefully that's useful and definitely recommended. And then of course we had the Ask Me Anything session. So the recording is now available. So if you're interested, you can go and check that out. On to what's new on the compute side. So the Azure Logic Apps ISE, that integrated service environment is being retired. That's because it depends on the classic cloud service, which is also being retired. And so end of August, 2024, I need to get off of that. And basically it will stop working. So if I have any workflows that run on an ISE, they will cease to execute. So I wanna to move to Logic Apps Standard. If you leverage VS Code, it actually has an export to Logic Apps Standard option to make it really easy to move those. App configuration, a reference for App Services Now GA. Remember, Azure App Configuration enables me to store those key values to be that central configuration store for all of the different applications in my environment. Well, now as part of my app service, for example, my environment variables, I can just reference an app configuration item and it will just be utilized. So I don't have to change my code in any way. It will just now be able to use that central configuration store from my app service. AKS Windows Annual Channel is now available in preview. So this is obviously for Windows node pools. And as the name suggests, this version of Windows Server will update once a year. And it's designed for your container nodes. And if I think about, normally if I think I have the container host that runs my containers, and the containers has an image. Well, that image has to be compatible with the host operating system. And so if I want to do an upgrade of the host, I have to go and redo all of my container images, rebuild them from a new version of the base OS image. What this is gonna give me is great portability. So I will be able to move to the Windows annual channel, but I'll still be able to run container images built on Windows Server 2022. The next version would support container images built on Windows Server 2022 or Windows 2025. Now, most customers are still gonna use the long-term servicing channel. That is every three years with five years of support. But if I need a quicker cadence, if I wanna take advantage of maybe new innovation or flexibility that's being brought in with those more frequent Windows Server versions, well, I can use the Windows annual channel, but I don't have to worry about constantly recreating all of my images. So that's the goal there. AKS OS SKU in place migration is now GA. So ordinarily, if I want to change the OS SKU, I would have to add new nodes, drain my old ones after cordoning them off, delete the existing nodes. There's a whole set of things I have to do. So there's a lot of overhead in terms of additional nodes during that process. What this does is as the name suggests, it lets me trigger a node image upgrade between one Linux SKU to another Linux SKU. I can't go to a Windows SKU. And specifically the target Linux SKU has to be Ubuntu or Azure Linux. But what it will then do is just a rolling cluster like it was used from an image upgrade process. So I don't have to create a whole bunch of new nodes. It simplifies the entire process for me. And then Kato fine tuning has gone GA. So this is the Kubernetes AI toolchain operator. Basically it makes it easier for me to deploy and operate inferencing AI models on a Kubernetes cluster. 
Well, now what I can do through this same tooling is I can select a tuning method. Often we might want to tune a model if we have some domain specific language, we want it to act in a, a major new way. Well, I can apply a tuning method to the model or within the Kato solution. And then virtual machine hibernation has gone GA for the general purpose virtual machines. So remember, Hibernate saves the memory and the CPU state to disk, which means I stop paying for the compute. And then when I start it again, it will resume from that hibernated state. We'll read in the memory, read in the CPU state, so I don't lose the actual running state. Um, so that is now an option. That might be really useful for, for example, virtual desktop scenarios where, hey, I want to stop paying the compute, I'm not using it, but I don't want to lose the stuff I was actually working on. On the networking side, so API Manager Developer Portal now supports WordPress plugins. And specifically, I can think about, often I will customize that developer portal for API management. Now with the WordPress plugins, I can use all of the WordPress capabilities to customize my developer portal. I can think fancy menus that expand and collapse. I can do style sheets. I can do themes, localization. All of those capabilities I can now unlock by using that WordPress uh, plugin. And the documentation goes through exact step-by-steps on how you would do that. Additionally, APIM STV1 is being retired end of August. So that's the single tenant V1 of APIM. You want to move to the STV2, which actually adds a bunch of resiliency and security options for you. For example, it supports availability zones, it supports private endpoints, it supports Azure distributed denial of service protection. Now the exact migration will vary depending on which features of STV1 you are actually leveraging. But depending on what you are using. Sometimes it can be an automated migration. Sometimes there are going to be some manual steps. But again, the documentation goes through the detail. On the storage side, so Azure Blob Vaulted Backup has gone GA. So historically, when we integrate with Azure Backup, it was just an orchestrator. And it would take those snapshots, those recovery points on the source storage account, which gives us a certain level of protection, but maybe not as much as we want. So what this now does is it will take those backups and put them in another storage account. So what it's going to use is the object replication feature of Blob. So it's going to asynchronously replicate to another storage account. And then whatever your interval of those um, recovery points are, it will take a recovery point on the source storage account. Well, then that recovery point would replicate to your secondary storage account. And only once it's replicated, then, hey, it's marked that recovery point has been created. So I get some separation between that primary and where I'm vaulting the backup. That might be really useful for maybe long-term backup requirements. It might be useful for regulatory requirements and security goals, etc. Storage lifecycle management has improved the archive control. So remember, with storage, we have tiers hot, cool, cold, and archive. And archive is offline. So if I want to read from archive, I have to rehydrate it into another tier. Well, one of the things you might want is I want to make sure it doesn't go back to archive straight away after bringing it out of archive. I want to keep it there for a certain number of days. And there is a feature that lets you do that. But before, it only worked with modified time. So there's a days after last change tier, and I have a greater than number of days. Well, that option will also now work with the creation time and the last access time. So I've just got improved abilities to control how long it would stay in a rehydrated tier before it goes and puts it back into archive. Azure Container Storage for ephemeral storage and Azure Disk has now gone GA. So remember, Azure Container Storage was built for containers, um, built for running container Kubernetes workloads in Azure. And the goal of it is that my developers don't have to understand Azure primitives. They can just use the Kubernetes primitives. And so this was all built on the open EBC, open source solution. And behind the scenes, what this does is it orchestrates and manages whatever the storage is based on the persistent volume requests I'm getting from Kubernetes. Well, now, the ephemeral, so that's the local NVMe or the temp disk or Azure disk 
for that backend storage is now GA. And then Azure NetApp Files encryption key transition is in preview. So if I currently have my Azure NetApp Files volumes protected with a platform managed key, well, I can now move to a customer managed key. If I just actually go into the encryption area of Azure NetApp Files volume, you'll see a CMK migration tab, which will walk me through that process. So if I need more control over the key used for the encryption, I can now go and transition to a customer managed key. On the database side, so PostgreSQL Flexible Storage Auto Grow is now GA. So as the name suggests, as I use more data, it will automatically grow the storage to avoid me running out and causing a problem. That is works for both the primary and the replicas. Obviously the replicas need to keep up or I'll get integrity problems. And actually when I turn this on, I would wanna make sure I turn it on on the replicas first. And then once the replicas are enabled, then I can go and turn it on with the primaries. Again, because what I wouldn't want is the primary to start growing and the replicas can't. So turn it on the replicas first, turn it on on the primaries, which will ensure, hey, I don't hit some space issues and cause integrity debt problems. PostgreSQL flexible customer managed key long-term backup retention is in preview. So this lets me go beyond the built-in 35 days of protection I get with PostgreSQL, and I can use the Azure backup long-term retention, so up to 10 years. It's using PG dump logical backup behind the scenes, and it will now work even with a customer managed key. I, I'm storing my own key in Key Vault to do that data encryption. And Cosmos DB for MongoDB now has semantic kernel integration. So this is for the vCore uh, version of the Cosmos DB. And what this lets me do, remember the semantic kernel, think of it like an orchestrator for large language models. It lets me hook into maybe vector databases and vector databases are really special because the data has a high dimensional, so lots of numbers, vector that represents the semantic meaning of the data. So it's not just the words have to match exactly, it creates this very thousands of dimensional vector that represents the semantic meaning. Well now then, if I'm trying to find data in natural language, because we often won't use the exact words, I create that high dimensional vector for what I'm looking for, and then I can do a nearest neighbor for all of those high vectors that are in the database, and I can, with natural language, based on what it means, as opposed to the exact words, find stuff that relates to it. Well, so we have that high dimensional vector capability with MongoDB under Cosmos DB. And so now with the semantic kernel, which is that orchestrator, using one of those memory connectors from .NET, I can go and connect to that vector database and use it as part of my application where I want to do retrieval augmented generation. I'm gonna add some more data into the call I make to the large language model. Miscellaneous, ServiceNow Washington version. Um, we now have the ITSM connector. So in my action groups, if I wanna hook into ServiceNow, maybe to go and create a ticket, for example, that could be based on a some Azure Monitor Alert or Log Analytics Alert. It will now work with the Washington version of ServiceNow. Azure Carbon Optimization is just in general preview for everyone. I did a video on this before, but if you just go and search for Carbon Optimization in the portal, um, you'll see it and it helps you track based on my resources, what's the, the carbon footprint of what I'm doing. And many companies have goals around that today. So it would help me decide, okay, well maybe types of resources to use, maybe I might wanna try and consolidate or maybe I'm doing some program where I make up for the carbon footprint I'm doing, buying trees or something, uh, I can track that. And finally, Azure Linux 3 has gone GA. So this was formerly CBL Mariner, but it's the Microsoft uh, Linux distribution. It upgrades the kernel to the current Linux 6.6 .6 long-term servicing series. It updates the OpenSSL, it updates System D, which is uh, we use a lot in the container workloads. It's got some other security packages. It's got some additional security changes to lock it down even more. And I can just go and download it on GitHub now. And that was it. Um, as always, thanks for watching. Till next video, keep on running.